word. We pray, God, that as we study the word of God today, that you give us unction from on high. Help us to understand your word, and God, give us the grace to apply it to our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask you to turn with me over to the book of Mark. We don't have this in the lesson sheet. Okay, can you hear me better? All right. right. Okay, Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, verses 17 through 23. And here, before I read this, let me say that the, the Pharisees uh, and the scribes, they asked Jesus, he said, why, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And so Jesus gave them a parable, and in, in verse 17, Mark 7, verse 17, he says, And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he saith unto them, Are ye also, are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. And so he's saying here that to eat with hands that haven't been washed is not going to defile you spiritually. But he says, what comes out of the heart, that's what defileth a man or a woman. Because it, uh, uh, you know, the sin nature, whether it be a saved person or an unsaved person, the sin nature, if we, let, if we as Christians let the sin nature have its way, it's going to produce all sorts of things coming from the heart. And they're not good uh, as far as God is concerned. And so now in the last lesson on parables, we considered Matthew 13. Verses 44 through 46. In those verses we saw two parables. The parable of the treasure in, uh, hid in the field. A field is a picture of the world. But what does this treasure picture? Do you remember? It pictures Israel. Put that in the blank. Israel. Also we saw the parable of the pearl of great price. The merchant man pictures Christ. The pearl of great price pictures born-again Christians. And now we come to a parable that reveals the state of the church in the last days. And this is the parable of the, uh, of the dragnet and the fish. I'm going to ask Brother Dunn, please read for us Matthew 13, 47 through 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like the nest that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. Which went this full, they drew the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Thank you, Brother Don. Now, this parable is similar to the parable of the wheat and the tares. Both show good and bad side by side. And then they're divided. And Jesus said to both of these, he said, so shall it be at the end of the age. And both describe the doom of the wicked. The wheat pictures God's people or, uh, that are taken into, into God's presence. The tares pictures the unsaved that are burned. And the dragnet, the fish, the good fish are kept, the bad fish are cast away. Now to understand this parable, we must analyze each part. Let's consider, first of all, the net. The net symbolizes the responsibility of Christians to spread the gospel to all the world. And that's what Brother Russ Hansen's been doing for years. That's what the Grays are doing. This is what uh, Bill Barker does, Brother Bailey does, and that's what we should be doing as well. We should be giving out gospel tracts and witnessing to people. 
And that's what it's all about. Now the gospel, like a great net, reaches and draws good and some bad. The good are those who believe with all their heart, with true faith and true repentance in their heart. The bad are those who make a profession of faith, but they don't believe and they have no eye, no uh, no desire to repent of their sins. And Hebrews 4 and verse 2 says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now, you know, here in the Springfield area, you know, you, you can talk to a lot of people. And so many of them say, oh, yeah, I'm saved. Yeah, I got saved when I was a little kid. Yeah. Do you go to church anywhere? No, I don't go to church. Uh, you know, do you read your Bible? Well, no, I haven't read my Bible lately. And, and you know, I get this uh, little pamphlet from Chick Tracks called The Bible Cry. And in there it said the, the, uh, the Bible organization put, puts out Bible. I can't remember the name of them. But anyway, they did a survey and they said that 26 million people in America across the nation have quit reading their Bible. And, and, and you know, uh, that's, that's sad, you know, but it, it shows that people are turning away from the Word of God and they're too busy on their cell phones and they're too busy doing the things they like to do instead of just taking time to sit down and read and meditate on the Word of God. And yet there's so many of these people that say, oh yeah, I'm saved. But you can't get them to talk about God. They don't want to talk about God. They don't want to hear about God. They don't want to go to church. They want to read the Bible. They want to pray unless they really want something. And if they want something or if they're sick or something, they want God to heal them, then they'll, they'll pray and ask God, please have mercy on me, Lord. Please heal me. And then if God heals them, then they don't, uh, they don't respond. They don't ever go back to church or anything. They just continue on with their life. Now, it's our responsibility to give the gospel to everyone. In Mark 16, verse 15, it says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every Christian. Now, what does that word every mean? Every. It means every. Not, not some, it means every. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is drawing the net. You know, when... When I got out of the Navy, we moved uh, back up to our home place up here in Albany, Missouri, north part of the state. And uh, my brother and myself and his three brother-in-laws, we used to go fishing down in the, in the Grand River. And uh, sometimes we'd uh, pull a net and catch fish. And sometimes we'd just set out trunk lines. But if we'd find an old gar in there, we'd throw him out and stomp on his head and kill him because we didn't like them things. And you know, I don't think you can eat them. I don't know. I never tried. I wouldn't want to try to eat one of them. They're just nasty looking things. But anyway, that's kind of kind of the picture we have here. Now, so it's the responsibility of every Christian to be involved in pulling the net. We need to try to win people to Christ. Now, we can't save anybody. Only Christ can do that. Now, secondly, let's consider the sea. The sea symbolizes the whole mass of fallen humanity. Romans 3.23 says, For all, not, not some, but for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's a lot of people that don't want to admit that they're a sinner. Uh, my brother, back years ago, I used to try to witness to him, and he said, Well, Raymond, I'm not a bad person. I don't... I don't ever rob him. I've never robbed anybody. I've never raped anybody. I've never murdered anybody. I, I, I know a lot of people a lot worse than I am. And so that's kind of the, the, the mindset that a lot of people have. They think, well, you know, I'm, I'm not as bad as that person. I'm not as bad as that person. You know, I'm sure that when I die, God's going to take me to heaven. I'm a pretty good person. So they get that mindset, and that's just from the devil because that's, you know, the Bible says, for all have sinned come short of the glory of God. And so that simply means everybody's not saved is on the way to hell. 
And I'm going to ask Sister Dunn, please read for us Isaiah 57, verses 20 and 21. Isn't that true? That is true of every ungodly person. You know, because people are, uh, I'm talking about unsaved people, because they're not saved, the devil can enter into them and cause them to do all sorts of things. A, a, a de the devil or a demon. Just like this young man, 20 year old young man down in Uvalde, Texas, that murdered those 19 little kids and two teachers. Just walked in there and just shot them. And them little kids were screaming and crying, and, and he, he just murdered them. No, no thought of what, what he was doing was bad. He just, and I think that young man was demon possessed. I really think he was. What ordinary person could do that? And you know, I think that's a result of his parents not raising him in church, getting him in Sunday school, getting him under the Word of God, and I think also it's a result of the, the school system that has kicked the Bible out. They don't ever refer to the Bible anymore. It's just all evolution, humanism, and all this other garbage. And so the news media, they talk about, well, why did this happen? Why, why did this young man do this? They say they don't have a clue. They don't have a clue as to what why people like that do things like that. Now the net was cast into the sea here in this story and did not enclose all of the fish of the sea, but gathered out of it some only of every kind. The gospel does not draw everyone, but only a few. And those <clears throat> that it draws, some of them are false professors. John 12, 32. Here Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, you know, there are those that say, Well, the Bible contradicts itself. And I might have mentioned this to you before, but back uh, several years ago, my, my dad's oldest sister, she died, and they buried her in the family in a cemetery up here in North Missouri. And my dad's half-brother was there, and I was witnessing to him, and he said, Oh, Raymond, I don't believe that Bible. That Bible's full of contradictions. I said, Listen, Freddie, I said, You show me one contradiction in the Bible, I'll give you $100. I said, You want to make $100? Show me in the Bible where it contradicts itself. Well, I don't know where it's at, but I know it's in there. And I said, Freddie, you're just blowing steam. You don't even know what you're talking about. And all the family members standing around listening to this. But anyway, he stomped off. He didn't want to hear any more. But you know, unsaved people, they use that as, you know, as an excuse not to, not to listen to the Word of God. But you know, because of what Christ did on the cross, the middle partition has been broken down. When you go back and you study the Old Testament and you look at the tabernacle, and then later Solomon built the temple, uh, just like the tabernacle and there was the uh, the temple proper and then the and then outside of that was the brazen altar where the animals were were crucified and the blood was pouring out in a basin and then the high priest would take the blood and uh, he would go to the laver which was just before the entrance into the into the temple and he would wash himself and he'd enter into the temple with the blood in the basin and there to the left hand would be the golden stand, the golden lamp stand, and to the right the golden table of shoe bread. And, and then before him, uh, just in front of the, the big curtain, was the golden uh, altar of incense. And then the high priest would pass through that curtain, and on the other side was the, the Ark of the Covenant with the two cherubim, golden cherubim, with their, with their wings overspread over the top of it. And then on the top of the Ark was called the mercy seat. And the high priest would confess his own sins and then he would confess the sins of the people and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. That covered their sin for one year. For one year. But you know, when Christ was crucified, when he died, when as soon as he died, there was an earthquake and God ripped that curtain from top to bottom. And I've read where it says that Six 
horses, three, three horses on each side, if they would have been fastened to that curtain, they could not have ripped that, that curtain. Only God could rip that curtain. It was so interwoven and so thick that it, it, was, it, it would have been impossible for, for, for six horses to rip that curtain. God ripped it. And because of that, there's no longer a Jew and Gentile in God's eyes. Now, the blood of Christ draws men from all races, creeds, and colors the world over. You know, the, the Catholics, you know, they, they say, well, we're Christians. And I mentioned this before, but out on the reservation, I had an Indian man ask me one day, he said, what's, what's the difference between a Christian and a Catholic? And so there's a lot of difference, and I explained it to him how the Roman Catholicism is 90% paganistic. And, uh, but you know, on Fox News, you know, most of them people on there are Roman Catholics, and they talk about prayer, praying, having Bible study. Then they talk about drinking beer. They talk about, you know, going to these places they shouldn't be going to. And so, you know, they're just professors, but not possessors. And I'd say, if, if there is a Catholic that is truly born again, he's born again in spite of what the Roman Catholic Church teaches and not because of it. Amen. Now, because of what Christ did on the cross, the middle partition has been broken down, as I said. And so now we, we look at the fishermen. The fishermen symbolize Christians. Mark 1, verse 17 as it said, and, and Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. I'm going to ask Sister Deanna, please read for us Luke 5, verse 10. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Thou shalt catch men. It takes the right kind of bait. <laughs> now, it's true, only Christ can save. But he uses Christians to witness. And when the Holy Spirit gets a person ready, he uses us to lead that person to Christ. Now, notice in the other parables referring to Christ, the pronoun is he. But in this parable, the pronoun is they. Notice it says they drew to shore. So you see, God uses believers to win people to Christ. And we have to be careful about that, that we don't lead the person to make a profession of faith that the Holy Spirit is not dealing with. Because sometimes we do that and we pick green fruit and it don't ever turn out. And so, you know, notice here, they had a mixed haul, good and bad. And you say, well, why does God allow that? Well, think about this. When Christ called his 12 disciples, one of them was the devil, Judas Iscariot. And he's the one who betrayed our Lord. And I'm going to ask uh, Sister Monica, please read for us John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus Okay, thank you, Sister Monica. Now, you know, Judas Iscariot, I don't know if you ever thought about this or not, but he was an ordained 
Baptist preacher, but he was lost, unsaved. And there's some Baptist preachers out there today that's never been born again. How do I know that? Because I've met some of them. I really have. And you know, looking back at verse 6, as Sister Monica just read, it says, This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. You know, it sounds to me like Judas was a Democrat. Doesn't that sound like that to you? You know, in fact, that's the way they are. And, and that, uh, So anyway, let's move on here and and let's consider the fish. The fish symbolized professing Christians. Some are good, some are saved, and some are not because some are not saved. And you know, I don't think we've done the parable on the ten virgins yet, have we? No. I don't think so. So anyway, I want to say something about that. You know, there in, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells us about ten virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. The wise virgins had oil in their lamps. Oil is a type or picture of the Holy Spirit. The foolish virgins had no oil in their lamps. And while they slept, and the, the, while the bridegroom tarried, they slept and slumbered. Then the call went forth. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And they all arose and trimmed their lamps. But the lamps of the foolish virgins went out. And they called to the, righteous, to, to the wise virgins and they said, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. They said, Not so, lest there be not enough for you and for us. But go into the marketplace and buy for yourselves. So while they went, the bridegroom opened the door, and the wise virgins entered in, and he shut the door. And the foolish virgins came back and began knocking on the door and said, Open to us, open to us. But the bridegroom from within says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And this is a picture I believe this is a picture of Christianity at the time Christ returns to this earth. And if that's so, that means 50% of professing Christians are not really born again. And you stop and think about that. Now, Matthew 7, 21 through 22, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, what is the will of the Father? Well, I'll tell you what his will is not. In 2 Timothy 3.9, he says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's God's will for people to get saved. I'm going to ask Sister Shirley, please read for us John 6, verses 37 through 40. All that the Father has given me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. For I come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will, this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all that he has given me, I, will, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again in that day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one that seeth the Son and believeth in him, shall have everlasting life, and I shall raise him up in that last day. Thank you, Sister Shirley. Now, Matthew 7, 22, it says, Many will say to me in that day, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And have we not in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? Now, I'm going to ask Brother Phil, please read for us Matthew 7, verse 23. <clears throat> And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work in equity. Thank you, Brother Phil. Now, there are many unsaved professing Christians today. And, you know, uh, many will say to, the, to him in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not, have we not prophesied, have we not preached in your name? Have we not in your name cast out devils? Have we not in your name done many wonderful work? We've fed the poor. You know, we've helped people. We've done this. We've done that, you know. And the people that were, were uh, stricken with a, with a hurricane or the tornado or the earthquake, we've, we've gone in there and we've helped them people. 
We've helped them people, but he's going to say to them in that day, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And so here we see the fish. Some are good and some are not. Some are saved, some are not. Now, this brings us to the angels. Here our Lord moves from the parable and states the reality of the end time. Looking at Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verses 49 and 50. It says, So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now when the rapture takes place, the saved are going to be gathered to the Lord in heaven. But the unsaved are going to be left here to go through the tribulation period, which is going to be hell on earth. And notice, the angels are the ones that's going to do this, going to separate the saved from the unsaved, not, not departed saints. And you know, looking at uh, Matthew 13, verses 41 through 43, it says, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. There then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, you know, in Genesis chapter 19. Let's go over there for a moment. Genesis chapter 19 verses 1 through 3 says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Now, Lot did not realize that these were angels. I don't believe he knew that. I believe he thought they were men of God but I don't think he realized they were angels. And he said, Behold, now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house and tarry all night and wash your feet. And you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him and, rendered into his, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Now, when we read the rest of chapter 19, we see there that the homosexuals were, I mean, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was full of homosexuals. And so they saw these young men enter into Lot's house, and so they went and, and, and they uh, banged on his door and said, uh, bring those young men out that we may know them spiritually, or not spiritually, sexually. That's what they wanted to do. And so Lot went out and pled with them, please don't bother these men. I have two daughters. Think about this. I have two daughters that's never known a man, two virgin daughters. Take them and do with them whatever you want to do. Now, you know, Lot was really a mess. He was a mess. And so anyway, they, they, they were going to they, they were going to grab Lot and jerk him out there, and they were going to deal with him in the same way but the angels smote those ungodly people with blindness. And angels have power. They have power to do that. And you know, I thank God that every born again Christian has angels that protect us. They're, they're very active in this day and age. The wicked of the city wanted the two angels and receive God's judgment. They thought they were men. And so they, they messed with their own, with their own uh, uh, people. Now, you know, it's our responsibility as Christians to drag the net. The angels are active now. They have been for uh, since man has been on this earth. And they will be to the very end. And uh, they're going to be active and separating the ungodly from the godly in the end time. So here we see the saved are going to be raptured. The unsaved will be left to go through the awful
tribulation period. Seven years of hell on earth. I mean, read the book of Revelation if you want to know what's going to happen in the tribulation period. It's going to be a bad, bad situation for ungodly people. So this parable pictures the state of the church in the last days. And we're there. We're in the last days. There's no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, it's been my desire, and I guess the, I think the desire of most born-again Christians that, that they wouldn't have to meet the death angel, that we'd just be raptured. Now, I don't know, you know, I, I remember an old preacher used to say, man, he said, I'm not looking for the undertaker, I'm looking for the uppertaker. But he had to deal with the undertaker because he's in heaven now. But you know, some of us, some of us are going to be raptured. We're not going to, we're not going to see death, we're just going to be taken out. And maybe none of us will. But some born-again Christians are going to be raptured. And so, you know, we just need to be in prayer that God bring about a great spiritual awakening all across America and around the world. And God's able to do that. And so, anyway, let's just continue to pray for our unsaved loved ones. And let's continue to witness to them every opportunity we get and to plead with them to accept Christ as their Savior. And, you know, only the Holy Spirit can bring them to Christ. But God uses us to witness to them, to give them the word of God. So anyway, all right, let's be, let's close in prayer. I'm gonna ask Brother Phil, please dismiss us in prayer.